So, let's get into the player's guide. And you were supposed to have read some of this beforehand. Um, let's, let's test that theory. What product are the companies in the business strategy game selling? Athletic footwear, very good. And sometimes I have people that are like, our team's gonna do stylish high heels. I'm like, is that athletic? And they're like, no. I'm like, you're barking up the wrong tree. Athletic footwear, that's what you're doing here. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys have at least read the introduction. Let's get up to company operations. Do you see that? I have gone through and done something amazing for you. I have proved highlighted stuff, for those of you who actually printed this stuff out, I have pre-highlighted stuff that you can uh, read along with. So here we go. Your company currently produces footwear at two facilities, one in North America and one in the Asia Pacific region. How many factories do you have? Two. Um, let's see. North America has sufficient uh, facility space to assemble five million pairs of athletic footwear annually with no use of overtime. What's overtime? Yeah, more than 40, 40 hours. Now, um, that's an American thing. If you go other places, the number may be different, right? But we are going to use American rules here and say everybody gets overtime after 40. Uh, what's interesting about overtime from a pay perspective? Yeah, time and a half. So in other words, it's going to cost you 50% more to pay someone to do overtime. Now, let's think about this. If you've got a facility and it's already got all the machines and whatnot there, would it be cheaper to build a new factory or maybe just work your people overtime? Ah, so it depends. If, you're, if your improvement in your business is small and temporary, wouldn't overtime make more sense? These are the sorts of things that you've got to make decisions about in business. Now, how do you know if the improvement is small and temporary? You don't, right? And that's one of the really negative things about business is we have to we have to kind of give it our best guess. Okay, so five million without overtime, but prior management only installed enough foot uh, making equipment uh, going into year eleven to assemble four million pairs without overtime. Now, here's what you need to know: uh, the first year in this thing, for some reason, I don't know why, is called year eleven. So that means that the next year is year 12, year 13, and so forth. We will be going, we will be going to year 18 in this class. And so that will, you'll actually have eight different years. Now, at the end, so we'll be getting toward the end in year 16 or 17, uh, whoever's on top says, can we just stop right now? And I say, no. And then we get to year 18 and someone's coming up from behind and they're going to say, can we keep going? What do you think the answer is? No, right? There's years 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, that's it. Okay, the somewhat newer Asia Pacific facility, while having sufficient facility space to assemble six million pairs, currently has only enough foot making, uh, footwear making stuff, four million without use of overtime. You may install additional production equipment in the two facilities. So you notice they don't contain all of the equipment that they can. And so you can install some more equipment and you can work overtime to increase your output without building a new facility. Okay, you can construct additional facility space to accommodate um, more than 11 million pairs. Both facilities can be operated overtime uh, to increase your annual assembly capacity by 20%, giving the current annual production capability of 9.6 million pairs without any additional equipment in the end use, without putting any in, in additional equipment in. Okay, they'll have an annual capa capability of 13.2 million if the company buys enough production equipment to fill the uh, facility space in the two existing facilities. Your company's sales volume in year 10 equaled 8.15 million pairs. Now this next part is extraordinarily important. You have ample time to consider whether to construct additional space at the two existing facilities or to construct new facilities in the Europe, Africa, or Latin American regions. Now, that is a strong hint. 
do you need to go out and buy additional capacity right off the bat? No. If you're out there and you are immediately starting to build out factories in places, then you are not paying attention to what this is really telling you. Okay. And, uh, let's see. Company markets its brand of athletic footwear to footwear retailers worldwide. So we got what, Foot Locker and stuff like that. And individuals buying online at the company's website. In years past, whenever the company had more assembly capacity than was needed to meet worldwide demand for its branded footwear, it entered into competitive bidding for contracts to produce footwear sold under the private label brands of large chain retailers. What's a private label brand? It's not generic, but it's also not a brand name, right? So uh, think Insignia. Have you guys been to Best Buy? And they've got these TVs that cost less and they say Insignia on them. That is a private label for Best Buy. You go to Walmart, you see something stamped great value. That's a private label for Walmart. When I was a little kid, Walmart's private label shoes were called Winner's Choice. And everyone's mother threatened them with having to wear Winner's Choice if they didn't behave themselves, right? Because we all wanted to wear something else. Okay, so what can you do with private label? Well, if, you're, uh, if you've got capacity you're not using to make your branded shoes, you can put that capacity to use making these private label shoes. Okay. We've already said we shouldn't expand immediately. Now we're on to the just-in-time supply chain. This eliminates the need for maintaining materials inventories at its facility. Can anyone tell me what a just-in-time just supply chain is? Yes. The materials arrive as they're needed. Yeah, the materials arrive just as they are needed. So I was actually able to tour a Honda facility in Ohio, and they were making Honda Civics. And as the as cars came down the line, they had, it was time to install the seats. And they had, uh, this is the front seats, they had two trucks that had, there were docks on either side of the factory at that point. And the seats actually came off the truck and went straight into the car. Now what does that mean? It means you've got to, a couple of things. Number one, you've got to be able to plan, right? And so these two trucks, when those first seats roll off, it felt, if this one's tan, this one better be tan, right? And if this one's black, this one better be black. But the other thing is, what happens if one of those trucks crashes on the way to the plant? Holds up or you're yeah, you're in a world of hurt, right? It stops the, the whole thing. So <coughs> there are benefits and negatives to just-in-time production. What recently happened to let, or just-in-time inventory, what recently happened that let us know just-in-time inventory might not be the best? Pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic hit, and we had all that supply chain crap, and what you'll notice if you go look at the balance sheets of firms everywhere, the amount of inventory that people are holding has gone up because you can no longer depend on getting things that you want when you snap your fingers. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, but apparently it's working fine for these footwear people. So we're not gonna have to have the raw materials in inventory at our plants. By the way, why do we not want to keep inventory? Any ideas? Yeah, storage costs. So first of all, uh, we gotta have a warehouse to put it in. And warehouses are, are not free. Now, what's a, another reason? Liability. Okay, so this crap might catch fire. Higher chance of theft. Higher chance of theft. Very good. Anything else? Okay, what about? Like, uh, if you have all, like, if you're not pretty or if you're not making as many sales, you just have product that's sitting and it's not making any money, you're spending money. Yeah. And, and you're, you're getting to it right there. You're spending money. So the inventory that we put on the shelf, we actually have to have the money to make that stuff or to buy that stuff. And so it's not just the cost of the warehouse, it's the cost of the capital that's tied up in the inventory. So 
we would prefer not to have inventory at all if we could get by with not having it. We're going to see that although we don't have a raw materials inventory in our business, we have a finished goods inventory and sometimes that can be the uh, death of a, of a team if they don't figure that out. Okay, the newly produced footwear is immediately shipped to one of the company's four regional distribution centers, so there aren't any finished goods inventories at the factories. Many countries place import duties on footwear produced outside their geographic region, and they give all these tariffs, and then they say that I can change those tariffs. Folks, I will not be changing the tariffs. This game, this uh, simulation is complex enough without me throwing extra monkey wrenches into your life. Okay, let's see, shipping and distribution center. Each distribution center maintains sufficient inventory of each model and size to enable orders to be delivered within one to four weeks. And so you're gonna have to decide whether you want to be able to deliver within a week, within two weeks, within three weeks, within four weeks. These are to your retail customers. What do you think your customers would prefer? One week or four weeks? One. So which is going to gain you more uh, favor with your customers? One week. Now, here's the downside. What has to happen to our inventory in order for us to be able to meet that kind of delivery time? If you're going to be delivering faster. By the way, how could I make sure that I could ship anything right now? What would I have to do with my inventory? I've got to have everything right i've got to have every model and every size ready to go right now now what if i said well i don't have to actually have it for another four weeks well in the meantime what i could do is make those shoes and so i could make them and ship them straight out and they wouldn't sit in my inventory so what i'm getting around to telling you is the faster that you want to get stuff to people the more inventory you have to hold Typical Amazon Prime, how many days? Two. Do you think they already have that crap? Yeah. If you want to see how much inventory they have to hold, go out to, they've got a new facility in Republic. Go out there and look at the size of that monstrous beast and then realize that that is one of dozens that they have. So if you want to be able to get stuff to people in a very quick amount of time, your inventories are huge. Okay, now we're down to competitive efforts in the marketplace. Company can enhance its footwear with new styling and performance measures on an annual basis. By the way, you're making one decision per year. These are years of the different time frames of the game. Um, can increase, decrease number of model styles in its product lineup. In addition, the company strives to enhance its sales volume and competitive standing against rivals via attractive pricing, advertising, mail-in rebates, contracting with celebrities to endorse its brand, building a stronger brand image and reputation with buyers, providing merchandising and promotional support to retailers to support stocking its brand, good delivery times on shipments to retailers and using search engine ads to draw online shoppers to its website. Now, oh my goodness, I think they just told you the things you can do to, to uh, improve your situation, right? You could go out there, you can do new styling, you can change the number of models, and I love it, they mention uh, celebrity endorsers. Um, can, are celebrity endorsers always a positive? Now, can anyone give me an example of a recent situation where a celebrity endorser was a bad deal? Mr. Stoner? But was it? Oh, okay, so that's, uh, I wouldn't call that person a celebrity, but yeah, okay, we'll go with that. So Bud Light, they killed themselves with an endorsement, and, and that's not my opinion, that's the numbers, right? Uh, by the way, what's the goal of financial management? Holy shit, this is your third class in corporate finance, and you can't tell me the goal of financial management? Very good, to maximize shareholder wealth. Oh my goodness, I, I am glad that I have probably less than 50 years left on this planet because you guys obviously are asleep at the wheel. Oh crap, okay. So, uh, 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 another one specifically, shoes. John Morant. Oh, who's that? John Morant. Oh, I don't know who that is. He had a deal with Nike until he 
flashed a gun on his Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first of all, that's a Second Amendment right. I mean, he's, he's got Fair enough. right. But at like a minor though. <laughs> <laughs> Kids like guns too. Okay, but now, was it good judgment? Right? Just because you can do something, should you? No. Right? Okay, so now let's let's go back to someone that I actually might know about. How about our friend Kanye? You guys remember what Kanye? Kanye had a sweet, sweet deal with Adidas. He's selling these shoes and what are they called? Yeezys or something like that? What did Kanye do? Talked about mustache man. <laughs> he what? Talked about mustache man. No. He, he, Kanye, what Kanye did was he said something perhaps unflattering about a certain group of people. Is that something you can get by with these days? No. And hey, it is proven. And so here's the fun thing though, because it stuck Adidas with like five billion dollars worth of inventory. Because those things were selling like hotcakes, right? And right up until Kanye does his thing, and now Adidas gets stuck with that. Okay, so uh, long story short, uh, your uh, celebrity endorsers may help or may hurt you. Okay, stock listings, financial reporting. The company's financial statements are prepared in accordance with the generally accepted accounting principles. That's GAAP, G-A-A-P, and reported in U.S. dollars. The company's financial accounting is in accordance with the rules and regulations of all securities exchanges where the stock is traded. In other words, you're not going to have to worry about going to jail because you're not reporting your stuff right, so don't worry about that. So let's talk about the worldwide market for athletic footwear. Everybody, every, all companies start year level, year 11, in exact same competitive market position. Equal in sales volume, global and regional market share, revenues, cost, profits, footwear, styling, and quality, prices, and so on. In the upcoming years, managers may pursue actions to alter their company's sales and market shares in all regions, opting to increase sales and share in some and decrease, increase, increase sales and share in some and decrease sales and share in others, including exiting one or more regions entirely. Okay, let's ask one question here before I get to the most important point. And that is, should market share be your goal? What's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder value. Let me tell you about a company that tried to, uh, in a very bad way, to keep their market share that was eroding. You all heard of General Motors? Yeah. yeah. And then, so the 1970s come around, we've got uh, gas prices go through the roof, and now suddenly people want gas fuel efficient cars. Well, they're not buying GM cars, they're buying Japanese cars. So what does GM do? Instead of trying to come up with a good fuel efficient car, they just lower, keep lowering the prices on the crappy products that they're making. And it got to the end, right before they went bankrupt, that they were only making enough money on each car to cover their retirees health benefits. That was it, right? So chasing market share is not the goal of financial management. Okay, now let's talk about the more important thing here. If every team starts in exactly the same position, I don't want to hear it's not fair out of anybody's mouth because you all started at the same spot. Now, let's talk about why people say it's not fair. What happens after the start has entirely to do with the decisions of the individual teams, the decisions of you and your teammates, and the decision of the other teams. And this is the part where people say, well, that's not fair because their decisions are impacting what's happening to me. Folks, that's life. That's life, that's business, right? When you get out there, it's not just what you decide to do that impacts you, it's also what other people do that impacts you. Now, we could call that unfair, but that's just life. I'll give you an example. One day I'm driving home from work, minding my own business, driving down National Avenue, and this girl 
just decides to just gun it and run across the street and she T-bones me right there on National Avenue down by James River Freeway. And I end up stuck to the Brahms sign. It was bad. Now, were her, did her decisions impact me? Yeah. Could I have complained about that not being fair? Yeah. Would it have got me my car back? No. In fact, I'm going to tell you that what life does is hands you a series of crap sandwiches. And what you're going to have to do is figure out how best to deal with them. So the true secret of success or failure in this life isn't the number of crap sandwiches life hands you. It's how you deal with those sandwiches. You guys got a big one here not too long ago, COVID, right? Some of you were still, what, in high school when that happened? That sucked. What's going to depend, what's going to, uh, it's, it's how you respond to that that's going to matter. And it's exactly the same in the, in the simulation. It's how you respond to these things. Okay, and then we're on to market growth. The combined effect of these factors is reliably expected to produce 7 to 9% annual growth in global demand for athletic footwear for years 11 to 15, slowing to 5 or 7% in years 16 through 20. But you notice the growth rates are not the same for all four regions. So, for example, Asia Pacific has a faster growth rate than North America. So does Latin America. Any idea why that might be? Remember last time we talked about the Wall Street Journal and about the external environment and what's going on? So there's a couple of things going on here. Number one, most of the developing com countries are going to be in like Latin America, Asia Pacific. Uh, they are getting bigger and bigger middle classes. What kind of shoes do middle class people wear? Athletic. Yeah. I mean, if you look at my dad right now, he's probably wearing New Balance, right? That's, that's just what middle class guys do. And so what's happening is we've got people moving into the middle class. The other thing that's going on is we have just pure raw population numbers. Are Americans having babies? Not like they used to. Are Europeans having babies? Not like they used to. And here's the good news. For every baby that comes up, whoop, typically they have two feet, right? So the market for shoes grows with the population roughly the double the rate. Does that make sense? Okay. Note, branded footwear sales to individuals at the company's website, which were 15% total branded sales uh, at year 10, are expected to rise one percentage point to annually to 25% of total branded sales in each region by year 20. In other words, the market is shifting away from physical retailing to online. Does that fit with what you see around you? Where actual growth will fall within the indicated two percentage point intervals varies by both year and by region. Thus, branded sales might grow 5.3% in year 11 in North America and 6.6% in Europe, Africa, and then grow 6.2% in North America in year 12 and 5.8% in Europe, Africa. Moreover, the forecasts are all based on the assumption that companies in the industry compete, compete aggressively enough to capture the growth opportunities and do not radically alter current price levels, product quality, models, etc. In other words, if you guys go out there and do a bunch of stupid stuff, is it possible that you would grow lower than these ranges? It absolutely is. Okay, let's see. Future growth rates may turn out to be higher than forecast in the event more buyers are attracted to purchase athletic footwear because of significant declines in industry-wide average prices, sharp increases in marketing or competitive efforts of the rival companies, and or significant improvement in footwear quality performance over time. Conversely, factors that can drive away potential buyers and cause the growth to fall below include sharply higher prices, eroding the footwear quality performance, greatly diminished marketing uh, and competitive efforts industry-wide. In other words, forecast growth rates in the table above are reliable only to the extent that rival companies on the whole do not pursue actions that result in future prices, product quality and marketing and competitive efforts that sit differ significantly from the levels prevailing in year 10. So they grow above uh, the expected range if you guys are doing a great job. They do below if you're not. Now, have we seen this in the actual world? Yes, we have. 
Uh, think about the smartphone market. The smartphone market, if you look back prior to 2007, it was pretty small and the devices were pretty pathetic. What comes out in 2007? I'll give you a hint, most of you have one. The iPhone. And suddenly, the market starts to grow. And then other people jump in, like Samsung, and it grows even more. Because they are working hard and, and competing aggressively, the market is growing faster than anyone expected as of 2006. So this happens in the real world. What about craft beer? If you guys roll back to when you were little kids, there probably wasn't a lot of, I know you don't drink craft beer when you're a little kid, but or at least you shouldn't. Um, it really wasn't a thing, right? You might have had one or two six packs of weird stuff on the shelf when you went into the grocery store. Now what do you see? Oversaturation. Oh, yeah, oversaturation. Very good. Okay, so they've been doing a great job. Now, moving on to page six. Ratings of athletic footwear styling and quality. The International Footwear Federation, a well-respected consumer group, rates the styling and quality of the footwear of all competitors and assigns a styling quality or SQ rating of 0 to 10 stars for each uh, offering. Their SQ rating is a function of five factors. Current spending per year per footwear model on new features and styling, the percentage of superior materials used, current year expenditures for total quality management and or Six Sigma quality control programs, cumulative expenditures for that same thing, and the current year and cumulative expenditures to train workers in using the best practices to assemble athletic footwear. Okay, let's, there's a lot to, there to unpack, so let's go through it. First of all, think of these ratings from IFF as being like from Consumer Reports. You guys know about Consumer Reports? And they hear, you hear the Consumer Reports top rated toothpaste. Well, they go through and they test these things and they issue ratings. And so that's one way to think about these. Another way would be on Amazon. You got the one to five stars, right? So these are ratings that people will know and recognize and pay attention to according to the simulation. Now let's talk about um, some things you may not have heard of before. Total Quality Management or TQM and Six Sigma. These are quality improvement programs. Why do you think improving quality, how's it going to impact your business? Take it. It's good. Okay, so yeah, it's good. Um, we will see though that there is a point beyond which you need to stop working on it because of what's called diminishing returns. You guys know about diminishing returns? Okay, we'll get to it. Okay, so basically, um, you can think of people want to buy quality footwear, footwear that's not going to fall apart. That's part number one. Part number two is when you make a bad shoe, does that cost you nothing? No, what's it costing you? Okay, well, let's assume that the, the bad shoe doesn't make it out of the factory. Materials and labor. Yeah, materials and labor. It's going to cost you materials and labor, and it might also keep you from meeting a shipment commitment to your customers. So improving quality not only improves the shoes that you're putting out, but it also makes your business more efficient and more predictable. So my, the, the business I was running back in 1997, we were making these uh, safety valves that went down into oil wells and they were like batches of one or two and it took a long time to make them and we would be getting very close to the end and then someone would screw up and we would have to remake a part. Usually this meant that I was missing my promise to the customer. Do you think the customer was okay with that? No, they weren't. And so quality is important. So how are we going to go about that? Well, we've got these TQM and Six Sigma quality control programs. And then we also, uh, and by the way, it's cumulative. Can you just spend this year and never spend it again and then that's fine? No, you need cumulative. What does cumulative mean? 
when it snows outside? What do they call the, the amount that it stacks up? Accumulation. That's the cumulative amount of snow that's fallen. And so what's happening here, it's the cumulative amount of money that we spend on these quality control programs. The other thing that we talk about is training our workers in best practices. Have you guys ever heard the term best practices? No? Nobody? Okay. So, do you think everybody knows exactly the best way to do everything? No. So even my wife and I have been together 30 something years and I'll see her doing something and I'm like wow that's really smart that's better than the way I used to be doing it and so then I adopt that best practice I worked at a factory in Oklahoma and we had sister facilities in Dallas Texas and in Fort Worth Texas and we would and everyone thought we were just going on like day trips just to have fun we weren't we would go to the other factories and we would all talk about what we think we are doing well. And uh, sometimes it was, they were things that were better than what the other factories were doing. And so then they would adopt those best practices at their factory. So for example, one that I brought from Oklahoma to Dallas, Texas was our ability to cut high temperature alloys, you know, like the stuff that jet engines are made out of. We had a super way to do that in Oklahoma. They didn't know about it in Dallas, Texas. So that was a best practice that we shared. And so what we're doing here with our workers is training them in the best practices. Have you ever, or best practices for putting together shoes. Have you ever watched a show called How It's Made? Yeah, you can go check it out, it's on YouTube. How It's Made and go find one about how shoes are made. And what's really going to impact you is how much of the process is manual, how much of it's being done by hand. And what that means is that the workers have a lot to do with the quality and the efficiency of the process. And so if I can train my workers a better way to do things, then that's going to come on through to my bottom line because of the improved efficiencies and the reduction in defects. Does that make sense? And it's also cumulative, uh, just like it was with the uh, TQM and Six Sigma. So the more, if we continually train the workers, we'll be better off. Okay, now something you need to know about the star ratings, the SQ ratings, is they are only based only on your decisions. You remember earlier I said that in this life what happens is not only dependent on our decisions but other people's decisions? The SQ rating is an exception. It is only based on the decisions that you make. And so these things that you choose, uh, how do you choose how to turn these knobs? That's going to give you an SQ rating that is known with certainty. Everything else, well most everything else, is going to be an estimate of, or a forecast of what, let's say, your sales are going to be. Uh, they're not known with certainty, but the SQ rating is. Okay, questions so far? Based on where each facility's output is shipped, SQ ratings are calculated for each company in each geographic region where its shoes are available for sale. Uh, so therefore, you could have as many as eight SQ quality ratings, one each for branded and private label, and then in your four areas. So four times two is eight. And a company's SQ rating in each market segment is a weighted average of SQ ratings at the production facilities from which the pairs were shipped. And so the, the SQ rating starts at the, at the manufacturing facility. Adjusted up or down for unsold years from the prior year. So they're going to give you a 0.3 star reduction if your stuff is left over from last year. Why would that be? Anybody here like wearing last year's look? No. So I have this colleague and she shows up in a suit and I mentioned the suit. And she says, oh, she says, yeah. I got it off the clearance rack at J.C. Penney. I said, it looks like it. I know that's cruel, right? But here's what she needs to understand. 
What kind of clothes wind up on the clearance rack? Clothes nobody wants. Clothes nobody wants. It's clothes that people with money and taste have passed over, right? When you go out to buy your interview suit, should you be buying it off the clearance rack? No. Do you think other people can tell when they see a clearance rack suit come through? Yeah. There's one exception, and that is if you are some weird size, right? If you are a weird size that nobody else is, and they manage to, to order a nice suit in that size, then it might make sense. But other than that, if you're just a normal middle of the road size, it just doesn't make any sense to shove the clearance rack. Okay, questions so far? Okay, wholesale sales to independent, so these are the distribution channels for athletic footwear. First of all, wholesale sales to independent footwear retailers. So this is where your company ships to people like Foot Locker and Dick Sporting Goods and all that. Online sales to consumers at the company's website and then private label sales to large multi-outlet retailers of athletic footwear. So those are your three markets, your three channels. Now let's talk about your retailers. They're recruited by small teams of company employed sales representatives working out of regional offices. The role of sales reps is to call on retailers, convince them to carry the company's brand, solicit orders, and provide assistance with merchandising and in-store display. Now, I'm, I'm going to share some things here with you that typically happen when you've got finance or accounting students making these decisions. Number one, do you think finance or accounting people value salespeople in general? They should, but they don't, right? And hey, I've been a sales guy. I can tell you, I've, I've had all these roles, and I can tell you it's true. Finance and accounting look down on salesmen, uh, but who's actually bringing in the business? The salespeople, right? Okay, now let's ask another question here. What do you think finance and accounting people typically think about spending money on marketing? They think it's a waste. That's one of the things you're going to learn throughout this experience is that marketing is not a waste. Advertising, advertising is not a waste. Celebrity endorsements, even though they seem kind of goofy, unless you really screw it up, they're not a waste. Okay, retail markups over the wholesale prices of footwear manufacturers can run anywhere from 40% at discount chains to as high as 100% at premium retailers. That's a shoe wholesaling at 50, usually retails between 70 and $100. Anybody here ever work in selling shoes? Nobody wants to confess to being Al Bundy. Okay, you guys don't even know who Al Bundy is, do you? You ever see the show Married with Children? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, what does this mean? Think about when you go to uh, shoe stores and you see uh, it's like 30% off. Are they still making money on this? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of money there to be, there's a lot of margin. The third channel, private label sales to large chain store accounts is attractive for two reasons. Number one, private label is expected to grow at a healthy 12% annual rate years to 11 to 15 and 10% Year 16 through 20. Is that faster or slower than the branded footwear market? We just got through talking about. Yeah, it's faster, right? So that's one reason it's attractive. Chain retailers that sell athletic footwear under their own label outsource the pairs they need from manufacturers on a competitive bid basis. Um, then the number one is, uh, the number two is making private label pairs for chain retailers allows a manufacturer to use production capability more efficiently and that can reduce overall cost per pair by utilizing some or all of the unused capability to produce private label pairs to help spread fixed costs over more pairs and improve overall financial performance. Now let's talk about this and then they, they're assuming you're, you're actually making money on your private label shoes. What's the difference between a fixed cost and a variable cost? Variable changes. Variable changes. The fix stays the same regardless, right? Okay, so let's talk about in terms of this classroom right now. I am a fixed cost. They are spreading my cost over 16 students in this class. What would it be more efficient 
if there were more students in this class. Yeah, then the fixed cost per student goes down and our overall cost of providing this service per student goes down. And so that's what they're saying here is we've got these fixed costs at the factory, like the plant manager salary, all that sort of stuff. Those things are the same regardless. So if we have more production coming out, assuming we're not losing money on that production, then we're actually able to spread those fixed costs over more units. And not only does that help the private label, that's going to help your branded production as well because this fixed costs cover all of that. Okay, now moving on down to competition. The efforts of footwear <coughs> companies to attract buyers and compete effectively with rival brands revolve around 11 factors. Folks, put like three stars next to this. Put like three stars next to this. So these are the knobs you're going to turn to attract customers to your brand. Pricing, styling and product quality is mirrored in the SQ rating. The breadth of product selection, we call that the number of models. Celebrity endorsements, advertising, brand image and reputation. The comparative sizes of the footwear retailer networks. The amount of merchandising and promotional support provided to footwear retailers. Mail and rebates and the speed, uh, the speed at which rivals deliver orders to your retailers and sales efforts at your company's websites. Folks, those are the things you're going to be doing to bring people to your brand. Now we're on to raw material supplies. All the materials used in producing athletic footwear are readily available in the open market. Do we have some sort of secret sauce foam insole the only we have? No, this stuff is, is commodity. Just recently suppliers confirmed that they would have no difficulty in accommodating increased materials demand in the event uh, footwear makers build additional production capacity to meet growing worldwide demand. In other words, you're never going to run into a situation where uh, suddenly there is no more material to be used to make the, shoe, make the shoes. Although in the real world, that actually could happen. So suppliers offer two grades of material, standard and superior. Which do you think might be better? Standard. Superior. Standard. It's easier to get. Well, okay, so let's, let's put it this way. Which do you think is considered to be of a higher quality? Superior. Superior, right? But he's actually right. Uh, we're going to discuss the, the fact that sometimes you're better off to increase your level of standard and lower your level of superior. And we'll try to get our SQ rating some other way. So that's going to be one of the things that you have to figure out. OK. The qualities of superior and standard materials are the same from supplier to supplier. All suppliers charge the going market price because of the commodity nature of the materials. Let's talk about a commodity. Um, is the iPhone a commodity? No, it's a branded good. It's a you really it's got features that are different than any other smartphone. Now, what about salt? Salt's a commodity. Salt's a commodity. Do I really care who I'm buying the salt from? No. Do I say, ooh, that's more than salt. That must be some sexy salt. No. No, I really don't care. Um, gasoline. As long as you know you're getting the top tier detergents in it. Uh, I used to buy nothing but shell gasoline. And Costco came to town and they've got the top tier detergents too. So guess what? Now I buy all my gas at Costco. It's a commodity. So what they're saying is these materials are commodity. Shoes can be manufactured with any percentage combination of standard and superior materials. Of course, as you put more superior materials in it, everything else uh, steady, you're going to have higher SQ rating. The base material price, and these are all subject to change by your instructor, by the way, do you think I'll be changing them? No. No. The only changes in material prices are going to be as a result of what's going on in the simulation. Currently $6 a pair <coughs> for footwear made of 100% standard materials and $12 per pair for, uh, per pair for 100% superior. However, the prevailing base prices are adjusted up or down to the percentage mix, uh, based on the percentage mix. So here, in other words, if you all decide to use superior materials, 
what's going to happen to the price of superior materials? Yeah, they're going to go up. What would that mean for the price of standard materials? Yeah, they're going to go down. And so you may find it helpful to zig when others zag. If everybody is going to superior materials, the price of those materials is going to increase. Price of standard materials may go down. Maybe you switch over and you do standard materials, and then you find other ways to achieve your SQ rating. The going market prices of standard and superior materials in any upcoming year will deviate from their respective base prices whenever the percentage mix is anything other than 60% for standard and 40% for materials, uh, for, for superior. Materials prices will fall whenever global production is below 95% of global production capacity and they'll rise when global production is above 110% of global production capacity. That's just supply and demand, right? Do you guys have to take an economics class? Did they teach you about supply and demand? Very good. Okay, so now let's talk about footwear manufacturing. No company has proprietary know-how that translates into a manufacturing advantage. What's proprietary? Say again. Secret. Yeah, secret. So uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. What's their proprietary thing? Herbs yeah, there are 11 herbs and spices. I only know what nine of them are. Right? It's driving me crazy. So that's proprietary. What about the formula for Coca-Cola? All we know is that there used to be cocaine in it. it. There used to be cocaine in it, but then, you know, people get, in, get their panties in a twist, and now suddenly you have to take the hard drugs out of soda for children. As far as we know. Uh, yeah, it may still be there. Who knows? Okay, uh, so if, if you don't know, the formula for Coca-Cola is a deeply held secret. It's kept in a vault in Atlanta, Georgia, blah, 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 right? So it's proprietary. And you can tell by tasting Pepsi that they have not got it. Okay. Um, so nobody has proprietary know-how that translates into a manufacturing advantage. What does that mean? It means you guys are all working with basically the same equipments and the same techniques. Uh, you're not going to be able to develop any sort of super machine or anything like that that's going to help you to stand out. Labor productivity is determined more by worker dexterity and effort than by machine speed. So you remember earlier I told you how manual this process is? That's why the productivity of the labor is, is uh, more dependent on their dexterity than on the machine. Productivity, it's the amount that each worker can produce. Let me give you an example of a machine that greatly increases worker productivity. What about the lawn mower? You guys ever mow a yard? Would you prefer to do that with a pair of scissors? No. So the lawn mower, let's say the walk behind lawn mower, greatly improves the productivity of the worker. They can cut more blades of grass per hour. Now, what about the right <coughs> mower over the push mower? We have another, yet another productivity jump. What we're saying here is that the technology, really the, the speed of the machine, isn't really making all that much difference in worker productivity. It has to do with the skills and dexterity of the workers. What's dexterity? Uh, no. Uh, Flexibility. Okay, you're getting closer. It's like the dirt. Manual dexterity. You guys really don't know what dexterity is. Okay, so uh, it's, your, it's the ability to do things with your fingers. You guys don't know that? It's the ability to do things with your fingers. And so I'll give you an example. I worked for a company, and we actually had this very fine electronic soldering operation. And the rest of our company was probably 90% male, 10% female. That operation was entirely female. Any guesses why? Hands are steadier. Yeah, so they, uh, manual dexterity, and this isn't a sexist thing, guys. Don't, don't come after me and say I'm a sexist for saying that women have better manual dexterity. It's just a fact. And w w did we hire, would we say we only hire women for in the, no, we'd hire anyone. But who lasted? The women, because they actually had that ability. So if uh, 
the, like being able to thread a needle, that's manual dexterity. I'm lousy at that. Of course, I've also got the shakes, but I'm lousy at that. So the point here is it has more to do with your workers. So do you remember earlier we talked about training your workers in best practices? Yeah, that's where we're trying to improve that skills menu and the dexterity of your workers is by training them in the best practices. Okay, let's see. On the other hand, there's ample room for worker error unless workers pay careful attention to detail the quality of workmanship suffers. Training production workers in the use of best practice procedures at each step on the job of the manufacturing process has recently become important to minimizing the reject rates on pairs produced. And so it's not only the number of shoes that they're making that's important, it's the number of good shoes that they're making. Does that make sense? And we're going to get to this. Uh, we're going to talk about paying these people. We're going to pay them a base salary, and then we're going to pay them incentive per pair produced. But if I just give you an incentive per pair produced, regardless of the quality, what are you going to do? Yeah, you're going to turn out a bunch of shoes that no one wants to wear, right? And so how am I going to reward you? I'm going to reward you for every good pair that you make. I have to be careful how I do that. Footwear industry observers expect company managers to look closely at the economics of where best to locate any additional footwear production facilities. While trainable labor supplies are available in all four great geographic region, the base wages for Asia Pacific and Latin America currently run about 35% of the base wages in Europe, Africa, and North America. All workers worldwide are paid 1.5 times their base for working overtime more than 40 hours per week. Now, do you think that's realistic? about the labor prices being lower in Latin America and Asia Pacific? Absolutely. Take a look at where your tennis shoes are made. Most of the time they're made in what? China, Vietnam, yeah, Thailand, yeah. And it's because of the low labor, labor rates. Worker productivity levels, labor costs per pair produced, and overall production costs of facilities in different geographic regions are not only a function of base wages and overtime pay scales, but also the fact that different facilities in different regions may have different fringe benefit and incentive compensation plans, spend different amounts for um, best practices training, use new or refurbished footwear making equipment, and may have invested in different production improvement options at the different facilities. We're going to get into all of that. It is a perilous leap. Uh, it's perilous to leap to the conclusion that production should be concentrated in Latin America and Asia Pacific regions simply because of the lower base wages and overtime costs. Now let's talk about why that might be. What happened to our supply of athletic shoes when COVID hit? Right? In fact, the supply of a whole lot of things went down. And it's because when you mix stuff in another region, if something happens in that region, then you can't get it. If something happens in the supply chain, the transportation of that stuff, you can't get it. And so there are other things to consider here other than just the labor rates. Right now, in fact, what we're seeing is people are doing what's called reshoring at manufacturing. What does that mean? Back to the US. Yeah, we're bringing it back to the U.S. or we are friend assuring it. We're moving it to friendlier company, countries. So for instance, like Mexico, where we can actually get this stuff. And it's uh, the wage, interestingly, the wage gap between the U.S. and China, we're only 30% more expensive than China is now. It used to be like they were 145th of what we are, but they, they're catching up. And so what's happening is now it actually makes sense to manufacture more stuff here. The other thing that's going on is automation. What does automation do to the amount of labor that's required to do something? Yeah, it reduces it. And so if I could set up a factory here in the United States that only has 12 bodies that are really just in there to keep the robots running, does it really matter whether that robot is in China or the US from a labor perspective? Not gonna matter a whole lot because um, the robots are the ones doing the work. But if it's in the US, then it's closer to the end user. So I can save a lot on shipping. And I don't have to carry as much inventory. By the way, it takes several weeks to get something across the Pacific Ocean. Did you guys know that? 
And the more, the longer it takes for you to get stuff, the more inventory you have to hold, the higher the inventory costs. And so there are a lot of benefits to being located in the market where the goods are being sold. And then another one we're gonna talk about is uh, foreign currency exchange risks. For example, do you know why BMW has a factory in the US? Do you think it's because Americans are such great car builders? No, it's the currency risk. If they're paying for their steel and their workers in dollars, and then they're selling the same cars for dollars, it eliminates the currency fluctuation risk. But what if they're making those cars in Europe? They're paying euros for their people, they're paying euros for their steel, and then they're over here trying to sell the cars for dollars. So there's another benefit of manufacturing in the same market where you sell. Okay, the cost of producing footwear in one region and exporting uh, some of the pairs produced to supply buyer demand in another region are substantially impacted by import tariffs, fluctuating currency exchange rates, and the higher cost of shipping pairs to foreign distribution centers. Check this out. It's $2 a pair to ship to a foreign distribution center versus the cost of shipping to a distribution center in the region where the production facility is located. That's a dollar per pair. So it costs half as much to ship a pair of shoes uh, domestically as it does internationally. Okay, we're uncertain whether tariff, uh, tariffs in the future years will rise or by how much. Uh, actually, I won't be changing anything to do with the exchange rates. I won't be getting in there and messing with those. But will the exchange rates change? Yeah, they actually change based on what's going on in the market, but we'll get to that more when we, when we discuss those. One strategy to escape paying import tariffs and guard against adverse changes in exchange rates is to maintain a production base in each of the four geographic regions and rely upon those facilities to satisfy demand for the company's branded footwear in the respective region. That's what the story I just told you about BMW. Exchange rate impacts. All footwear companies are subject to exchange rate adjustments at two different points in their business. The first occurs when the footwear is shipped from a facility in one region to a distribution warehouse in a different region. So that's the first time you're gonna get hit with an exchange rate adjustment. The second adjustment occurs when the local currency where the company receives the payment from the local retailers and online buyers over the course of a year gets converted to US dollars for financial reporting purposes. Remember, we're an American company. We've got generally accepted accounting principles. Our financial statements are in US dollars. And so, even though we're selling shoes in Brazilian reals or in um, euros, we have to convert those to dollars to be on the balance sheet. And that can have a material impact on the earnings of a firm. It wasn't too long ago that uh, Procter & Gamble reported that currency fluctuations had dampened their profits by, they're, they're selling the same amount of soap over in Europe, but the fact that the uh, currency exchange was against them was hurting their earnings. Okay, let's see. So we got that. Now, moving on to page 10. BSG automatically accesses all the relevant real world exchanges, exchange rates, I should say, between the decision periods, handles the calculation of uh, both types of exchange rate adjustments, and reports the size of each year's percentage adjustments in your corporate law lobby as well as on pertinent entry pages and in company reports. You will definitely need to keep a watchful eye on the size of exchange rate adjustments each year and understand what you can do to mitigate adverse impacts. What does mitigate mean? Yeah, to minimize the impact of, right? To mitigate the adverse impacts and to take advantage of positive impa impacts when in shifting exchange rates. Um, and they, they tell you some stuff there. It's, you should probably, and by the way, are you starting to get the feeling that this thing is more complex than you thought it might be? Are you starting to get the feeling that you actually have to read this for yourself? Am I going to read the whole damn thing to you? No, I'm not even reading the whole thing to you right now. I'm only reading you the highlighted passages, right? Okay. Um, real world exchange rates between year 11 and year 12 serve as a basis for exchange rate adjustment for year 13 and so on. Now, here's the fun thing. In the game, you know what the currency situation is going to look like in the coming year. Does that sound like reality? No. So this is another thing that actually should make this easier for you. And in fact, I've had <coughs> students in their presentation tell me that the way they handled these uh, currency exchange situations 
actually determine their ability to win. And so if, if your currency's strong, then you can buy stuff from people with weak currencies and then sell it over here. And you, you can make a huge swings in your profits just by choosing where you're manufacturing versus where you're selling. Okay, let's see what time we've got here. I, I've got around 12.08. Let's stop there with our discussion for today. No, we're not going yet. Tell me, I, I'm going to ask you some questions here. What are the two kinds of material that you can use in your shoes? Standard and superior. If you want to make really high quality shoes, which of those all else equal would you choose? Superior. superior. What happens when more people choose superior? Yeah, the price goes up on superior, but what happens to the price on standard? It goes down. Do you think it works the other way too? Yeah. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, what's more important for labor productivity, the machines or the people? Yeah, it's definitely the people. What are the problems with producing a bad pair of shoes? It hurts your SQ rating. It hurts you what? SQ rating. Yeah, oh, OK. So it, I think it does impact SQ. But uh, more than that, you're wasting materials, materials labor. labor. And then you got to get rid of the stuff, right? Um, and it's also a shoe, pair of shoes that you basically have got to remake if you want to meet customer commitments. What about marketing? Do you think marketing is important? Based on what I've said here, right? Um, and advertising. And in fact, we're going to see that there's some interplay between these things. Let's say that I've got a great celebrity endorser. My, my neighbor girl went, you don't have to put your stuff up yet. My neighbor girl went to a Taylor Swift concert. They actually opened up the parking lot two days early to sell crap to the people that were coming to see Taylor Swift. Let's assume that your shoe company manages to land Taylor Swift as a celebrity endorser, but you have zero spending on advertising. How impactful is that celebrity endorsement going to be? Damn near zero. What you need to be doing is spending money on advertising, showing Taylor out and about town in your shoes, right? And so what we're going to see is that some of these things, uh, they, you say, oh yeah, that's a good idea, but if you don't do it along with something else, it'll have little or no impact. And so this is reality. This is how business works. And that's one of the most amazing things that I learned. By the way, when I was an MBA student, I did one of these things. And it was just amazing what I learned. Number one, uh, I was an engineer at the time, but do you think engineers value marketing? No. Do you think engineers value advertising? No. Uh, I was just amazed at the impact that those things made. The other thing that I learned is this whole idea of other people's decisions impacting my success or failure. That's reality. And right as I was finishing that, uh, I went out and I became a salesperson and I actually got a big contract and took it away from another vendor. Did they do anything wrong? No, I just came in and did it better and cheaper. So their sales went down as a result of something I did. That's just reality. Now I'm pleased that in this case the story turned out to my favor. Do you think there were some other times when it didn't? Yeah, right? So this is reality. What your competitors do impact how well you do. Some, some of you actually play sports, right? Who is, someone's on the club volleyball team? Does it matter the quality of your competition on whether or not you win or lose? Yes. Yeah, you go up against a bunch of bums, chances are you're gonna win. You go up against a bunch of pros, chances are you're going to lose. Are you guys any better or worse as a result of all that? No. It had all to do with who you were facing off against. That's reality. That's life. Questions? Okay. If you have not printed off your player's guide, do you understand now that you need to print it off? Yes would be a good answer there. Okay, I'll see you guys next time.